deleted, and either that was a typo or an indication I should broaden the topic. I decided it was the second, um, so I'll, uh, I'll make this slightly broader than I had intended. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking a lot about how you can move materials around in soft, uh, in soft materials, and move the chemical constituents around, um, which I hope uh, is relevant uh, to uh, folks doing liquid crystals. And then uh, my main uh, goal is to tell you about a, a fairly recent new class of materials that are just dramatically easy to use and lots and lots of fun, and sort of share with you uh, the, the fact that uh, these can uh, perhaps be useful to you. So I'll uh, introduce this photochemically driven mass transport. Uh, I'm going to, since I'm over here in the physics world, I thought I'd start uh, with photorefractive crystals. Do people know what photorefractives are? Got some nodding. Done a lot of research, of course, here uh, in physics farm using them for folks like Danny Anderson. And I'll use that to motivate these, uh, these photopolymer materials. Then I am an engineer, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I'll have lots of fun uh, with telling you about uh, some of the applications and then sort of where the, the field is going. Uh, shamelessly concentrating on research in my own group because that's where I have the slides. Um, so uh, here's lithium niobate, very traditional uh, photorefractive material. You roll a blue of this stuff, you slice it up, you polish it, you AR coat it, and you get little bits of material. And you can make these uh, millimeters to centimeters thick and do all sorts of interesting volume holography in them. And this is the materials I'm going to try to lead you to today, where you do a little cooking. You cast these liquids between a couple of glass plates to let it solidify. You have something which looks vaguely similar, uh, which is some thick slab of material. So I'll walk through a really brief introduction to remind you of what are practice, and then I'll try to convince you that if you understand those, you know a lot about these photopolymers. Uh, let's just say we've got an interference pattern, and that's uh, uh, got some sinusoidal intensity fringes uh, shown here. And we put that on a photorefractive crystal, and I'll just do one dimension so I can actually do drawings. And uh, that's going to take and ionize some donors, and so I'll have some positive charges uh, in, uh, in the uh, tracks, and I'll uh, excite some conduction band electrons. And before anything happens, uh, obviously this is informal, so stop me if I'm not making sense. Before anything happens, that is, uh, no time has gone by, if I looked at the charge density, it would be flat. Because I've got some positive charge, but I've got uh, the same negative charge sitting in the same spots in space. I've just separated them spatially, so uh, I clearly uh, I don't have any uh, variation in that total charge density. But what's interesting now is that the positive charges are uh, constrained; they're, uh, they're, they're uh, can't move. But the conduction band is the important part here. The uh, electrons uh, are free to diffuse. And if we take a, uh, a sort of idealized long time limit where we say that the electrons will diffuse out and they will sort of uh, become spatially equal to this average value down here, then suddenly the charge density looks like a shifted copy of this charge density from the ionized donors, adding these two up, which conveniently is a copy of the intensity. So then I've copied the intensity into a local charge density, and the diffusion was the key, key thing that made that happen. And then through the electro-optic effect, um, that I'm going to generate electric fields, and the amount of that's going to generate an index change. So I get away to copy my intensity into an index change in these materials. And in this particular case, there's a 90 degree phase shift between uh, the uh, uh, intensity pattern and the eventual index change. But the key idea is I make something mobile, it moves, I end up with a charge density, and that charge density generates an index. <coughs> I'm going to try to lead you through a shockingly similar looking set of pictures. So now I'm going to do a photopolymer. Um, and I'll talk about other materials than just photopolymers here, but that's a good place to start. And I'm going to make the same exact thing. Shamelessly copy the picture over here to, to save myself time. Um, but now what's going to happen? Well, I've got in here, uh, this is a solid, I'll talk more about this. I've got a bunch of monomer. I've also got some sort of uh, uh, bio photo initiator, but I'll get back to that. And the important part is wherever I have bright light, the monomer is going to turn into polymer. Notice the choice of colors here, uh, E for positive and M for minus, if you like. So I lose some monomer here, but I gain some polymer. And wherever there's bright light, I make polymer and make a monomer. Well, so if I looked at time equal zero at the mass density, as opposed to charge density now, before anything can move, I would find the mass density is uniform in space because nothing's moved. And I've just converted, converted monomer into polymer, and I've joined it up. And so I really haven't done anything interesting. 
there could be a very small index change here because the monomer and the polymer might have slightly different indices, but I've got the same number of electrons in space and the polarizability is that much different. So you don't get too much uh, index change. So that would be kind of dull. But, again, along with this, polymer is very rapidly a large molecule. Poly, many, right? So it could have a molecular wave to measure thousands of times the, the monomer, depending on how they join it up. So it can't move. The monomer, however, is small, and the materials are going to be soft, as I said. We're going to be uh, rubbery, I will show tell here. Um, and what that means is diffusion is allowed for those monomer units. So here's, here's what they look like. They're, they're, they're on the um, so monomer can move. So what happens in sort of an idealized long time limit where the monomer takes on its average value? Suddenly, the mass density looks like a copy of the polymer density, which is conveniently a copy of the intensity. And now, instead of the electron optic effect, just to uh, uh, the change in density, we suddenly see an index change. And then index change can be large, it turns out. That's one of the things that makes these materials interesting, because I've moved a lot of mass around. And just to sort of motivate the talk, beside the fact that these materials are cool. Uh, it turns out in soft materials, if you're consuming chemicals, if you're making uh, density gradients of material, this is probably happening. This, these, these diffusion driven effects are shockingly common. Um, and that might be interesting for you as to work in, in uh, liquid crystals, for example. So, uh, a brief and perhaps unfair comparison. Somebody's a photo attractive uh, fan wants to argue with me. Um, but the index change tends to be larger than the photopolymers. These are crystals, and they don't change in dimension. Uh, there's a tendency in polymerization for small molecules to join to big molecules, and that uh, drives shrinkage. Um, and so with lots of uh, hard chemical engineering, that shrinkage can be brought down to the point that even if you use thick volume holography, it's not really a problem, but it's something you have to pay attention to. These are generally limited to operate with the high energy photons in green uh, and, and shorter. Uh, though it's not easy, uh, really smart organic chemists can drive these things up to working even clear out into the near IR, which is, uh, it's harder and harder and harder to go out there, uh, but it's possible. Um, probably the biggest reason that these have been developed is this one right here. Uh, making this much of the stuff is dollars in cost. Making one of that is thousands and thousands of dollars, and that's probably one of the, the biggest things. And you can make, if you want to make a slab of this photopolymer this big, you get yourself a glass that big and cast it. And so it's very easy to make, but for example, discs. Uh, a disc this big with an eye would be possible, but you should get your check out. Um, these tend to be dynamic materials, uh, though through various thermal processes, for example, with an eye you can move electrons over and get them to the deep traps and make them essentially permanent. These tend to be materials you use once. However, uh, it's possible to use a second color and excite things and break bonds and drive them back to the state they were in to get to sort of a reversible process. However, that tends to happen 10 or 20 times and then various little organic side reactions happen and you can't keep going. But it is conceivable, and no one's done this to my knowledge, it's conceivable one could use these materials in the kind of dynamic optical uh, processing uh, environments that these have been used in and potentially with some interesting features. But probably you can do it for 10 minutes and then you put a sample in because it would have wandered off into some uh, organic state if you wanted to. How do you compare with the small stuff? Um, wow, uh, I'm going to check it out and say it depends. Um, mm -hmm. uh, because, of course, even here there's a dramatic range depending on the kind of material and intensity and if you put an electric field across it to cause drift instead of diffusion. Um, and, and this is why it really depends. Diffusion, uh, fixed law tells us that diffusion time scales are related to spatial scales squared. So if you're making a holographic fringes with a 200 nanometer period, uh, you probably have sub-microsecond response times here. But if you expose an area, a centimeter in an area, it might be four days uh, before the diffusion happens. So that's broad diffusion <laughs> time scale. So I don't know how to make a direct comparison. Um, these are mainly crystals, so there's a, a current effort uh, very exciting uh, in, uh, in making uh, organic versions of these, and I think it's very interesting because in the long term, the organic guys have a lot more knobs to pull, and they can typically give, give them 20 years, and they will make materials that are often better uh, in a lot of fields than organics. And these are well described in the current equations. A recent photographic meeting was held in honor of Kukura for the incredible success. 
uh, that this one bit of physics has an ascribable release, and nobody has yet accomplished that here. Um, and the reasons here, there's just so many variations and so many different things you can do. However, it's a very active area of research. So this is the driver. Uh, this is a group uh, over in Lomax, one of uh, Bell Labs. Um, they're just releasing uh, products. Uh, this is one of their discs right here, which I have taken apart to get some of the materials out of it because I want to be able to show you that. Um, these are 300 gigabytes on a single disc, and it's done to dynamic, well, not dynamic, but a done to holography where you split it into two, you go through a megapixel SLM, and you integrate those two on the material, you store it in bits of data, and then because it's a thick material, you can overlap hundreds or thousands of those holograms at one location uh, through graphs of activity and store lots and lots of data. And that's what's driven their development, though I'm going to tell you there's also other really fun things we can do. <coughs> so that was good. I'd like to tell you just a little bit about how to deal with these materials. And I have only one slide here, because it turns out they're really easy to deal with. Um, and that's, that's perhaps one of the most exciting things. Um, you start by cooking. Uh, your chemist tells you you need two of this and six of that, and in certain ratios. And you mix them up. I have undergrads do this in, in the chem lab. <coughs> And then you cast the liquid, it's initially a liquid material, and you cast it uh, into a cubette. Uh, that's a 5 cent cubette from a uh, spectrometer. Or between some glass slides. Or in a slot that you then peel out. I'll show you what I want to do that. Um, and you might care about it sticking to those glass slides or something. Uh, so I need you to be important. Um, now you have this liquid uh, that you cast between the two sides of this disc. And we don't really want to work in a liquid state, because I've done this just for fun. If you make a hologram or some structure, it's higher density, so it sinks. And that's, it's kind of fun to watch, but it's not really useful. So it's nice to work in this flexible solid state. It's got to be flexible, so the diffusion is allowed. So you could take a photocure system, you shine some light on it, and you get past the gelation point. There's enough cross-links that you have a solid. But you stop before you, get, uh, you use up the entire dynamic range of material. That remaining dynamic range is what you're going to use uh, very interesting stuff. Or, and this is the specialty of these uh, this Bell Labs now, you could actually have what's called a matrix polymer, and that's actually what this is. It's, it's vacuum polymer, uh, basically. Um, it's a high quality optical boring polymer in lots of ways. And you diffused into it something that gives you some color, um, your photopolymer. So the matrix cures out thermally, and then diffused into it, you're left with this photoactive component. Then it turns out in systems that use radical photo initiators, uh, oxygen, uh, turns out, I've tried to get out of grad students to hold their breath for a couple hours and it doesn't work. So they have to work in an oxygen environment. Oxygen diffuses neatly into the material because oxygen is small. Um, and oxygen quenches radicals. So you need to get rid of that oxygen. The easiest way to do is trying to put a light on it to generate the radicals that are, would, would normally go off and start your chemistry. Instead, they're attacked by the oxygen. But do that little while, you get up all the oxygen and you're ready to go. And you do whatever you do, and I'll show you lots of things you can do with that. You're left with, and so you've made some index distribution to move, move monitor around. In three dimensions, you've, you've done something cool. Now you'd like to go show it to your buddies. You might say that the room lights here and not have it uh, disappear. And so you just shine incoherent light from the system. You eat up all of the dye. You start polymerization everywhere. Monitor is slowly is turning into polymer everywhere, but there are no gradients, so nothing diffuses, so nothing changes. And you bleach the system, you cross the color polymers, and you're done. So it's a really nifty system to allow you to reach down into deep 3D volumes and first create index patterns, like spatially localized light, and then make it photoinsensitive by uniform light. And you can reach clear down in there. You never have to get chemicals or heat or something ugly down into the material. And that's what makes them cool as an optical material. I think. Um, so, I could talk about this for a very long time, and we put you all to sleep. So I'm going to tell you just three results, kind of to give you a flavor for the theoretical modeling of these materials, and also sort of three important things you might want to know if you decided to go play with them. Um, and then we'll get on to the fun applications, as I mentioned after all. Uh, this is a typical rate equation you use, and it'd be one of the main rate equations you use to describe the chemistry of these systems, and it's not to give you a flavor or uh, a little bit of, of the sort of things you might worry about. So this is some photo initiator, PI yeah, photo initiator. You've got height, for example, that's going to absorb light and do something interesting. Sorry about the polymerization. And we'll put a dot on it. I apologize for the chemists in the room. I know that the notation isn't perfect. But to me, it's exciting. This one has absorbed a photon and it's ready to do something. 
And so that's going to grow in time due to the intensity interacting with some unexcited photoinitiator. And there's my first sort of uh, head scratcher. Because that intensity is perhaps maybe a focused beam going down to the material, the plane wave propagating from the material, which is of course going to depend on the absorption of the material and the index. So I immediately have some interesting coupled nonlinear propagation problem. Oops. Um, interacting with the, uh, as I said, the, the unexcited initiator, well, there's my next oops. Because I said that everything diffuses these materials, and I mean everything diffuses these materials, stops moving around all over the place. So I don't actually know any of these concentrations after time equals zero because they're all moving around. So I get a coupled problem of nonlinear optical propagation, chemistry, and mass transport. And that keeps graduate students busy um, trying to disentangle that multi scales problem. Um, I'm generating this excited state, um, but it's going away. Uh, it gets trapped, it runs into some termination agent like oxygen, and it might disappear. And radicals in particular like to join up with radicals and become one radical again, so they undergo line molecular -like termination. And the reason I wanted to show you that is if I make a steady state assumption, I assume this is zero, then I can solve for, I've got zero here, this just looks like a quadratic equation in this quantity. So I can solve for the uh, density of this excited molecule, which is going to go off and drive my chemistry. If this term wasn't here, I'd see this excited molecule was linear in intensity, which is kind of what I would have guessed. But the point is, this is one of the things I want to tell you when you go out play with these things. If this term dominates, I have a lot of fine molecular termination, let's say this one is here, then I see that the density of excited initiator is going to be like the square root of intensity. So this material will respond like, and I apologize for saying these words, a half photon material. Yes, there's no such thing as a half photon. But it does respond like the square root of intensity. And that can be bad. And that's a characteristic of radicals. That's why you need to understand how your chemistry works. And what that would do to you, let's say I just focus a beam into this material, and I drag the material by. So I've got a Gaussian beam into this material, and I drag the material by transversely. If I have a sort of linear material, I'll characterize that with a parameter alpha of 1 for a, a, a power law of tendons, then I would see a projection in my Gaussian beam transversely. Here's the focus, and here's the other focus stuff. If I ran into a two-photon uh, initiator, for example, I lose a lot of my other focus stuff. That'd be good. But as I go this way in these radical materials, I may see these wings get bigger, 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 and bigger. And as an engineer, I don't like the threads bigger. I like to make loop wings. Um, so initiation chemistry is one of the things I have to pay attention to. And you can fix this. You can, you can change these things, but you need to know what's there. And it's just to say that it's not all theory. We can go do this. We can use different kinds of initiators. Initiators, uh, we can drive them into different regimes, and we can see sort of linear behavior, we can see the sublinear behavior, and we can even go to really straight sort of fancy land regimes where uh, the uh, materials turn so upside down that even the light is most intense here, it responds best out of focus. And so this is sort of thing you want to know to avoid being terribly confused. What kind of things do those look like on the bottom? Those are, thank you, those are differ differential interference contrast microscope images. Which means that your eye interprets them as rubber sheets uh, that have been illuminated, but that makes it a differential phase image. So really, um, this is a, a, a volumetric image of the phase in the material, but it's derivative of it. Um, and your eye just turns that into a rubber sheet, unfortunately. Um, okay, so that's thing number one to know. Thing number two to know, and this is really when the whole uh, field of theoretical model of these materials got kicked off uh, on the analysis group. Is they said, look, we have multiple different processes going on. Uh, we need to understand uh, them, and it turns out they're time scales, uh, was the way to understand them. And they derived this unitless constant, um, which was the rate of the monomer diffusion, which is something I mentioned as being important, to the rate of polymerization, how quickly you're consuming monomer. And if that ratio is high, that is monomer to diffusing quickly, then here's a single fringe of a hologram of an intensity that's going sinusoidally this way. And I'm basically creating polymer here in the middle. And if monomer diffusion is fast, I'm scooping out monomer from my bathtub, but it immediately fills back in. So the monomer bathtub just slowly drains. And it's always uniform in space. And that means I pretty much build a polymer that looks like my little sinusoidal intensity distribution. And as an engineer, I say, oh, I have high fidelity. I'm actually recording in the polymer a good copy of my optical intensity. But what if monomer diffusion is slow? This number is small. Well, now I start to consume monomer by building a polymer, and now I have a bathtub full of honey, and I'm taking scoops out of the middle of the bathtub, and the honey isn't running in fast enough, and so the polymerization begins to slow in the middle because it's starved. 
Or said another way, the monomer is diffusing in, but before it gets to the middle, it polarizes. And you get this characteristic flattening and then these sort of ridge structures where I begin to build up polymer on the edges. Isn't the rate of modern diffusion going to be dependent on how much dilation you have? Yes. It's always changing? And temperature and spatial scale. Uh, the rate of polarization is going to be dependent on intensity. If I can turn my intensity up and make it go faster. So yeah, I can have an experiment which runs great one day, and then I change something, and it could be a completely different result. Temperature is just an obvious one, right? Because that changes both the rate of polarization and diffusion in different ways. So yes. But I mean, your, your material is changing in real time. Ah, OK, yes. Um, so the next level of sophistication on this paper is to say, OK, how does my diffusion coefficient depend on the level of polarization? And that's the good hint of why this is complicated. Because now you've got to try to figure out how to measure that, which isn't so easy, et cetera. So yes, yeah, this is a simple model where uh, the diffusion coefficient d is uniform in space and time, which is wrong. Yeah. So I don't like this. I don't like that my features, particularly where, where I like to operate, which is I want to consume a lot of material in time and good, strong things. And I'm going to do it really fast, because, well, fast is cool. Um, they tend to make features that are broader than I'd like. And that's, that's not something I want to do. Um, so this is work out of my group, uh, which is kind of fun, uh, which says there's actually a way to do the opposite. Because uh, I mentioned oxygen in these materials, and you can also put in intentional inhibitors, but oxygen is a nice place to start with, so you can use free. What happens if it moves? Because it does. Well, it turns out you can define exactly now this constant, which is the rate of this inhibitor diffusing around, to how efficiently and how much rate the rate of inhibition is. Let's just say that number is low. So again, my inhibitor is not getting to move around before it gets used up. The same analogy as I had before. And this is the same two cases I had before. What you find now is the monitor, in this case over here, the monitor was happily moving around. So the monitor was always uniformly distributed. The inhibitor is getting to the edges and getting used. So I don't get inhibition in the center. I only get inhibition in the edges of my exposures. And that tends to make things that are peaky and narrow. I like that, because I like making those narrow things. And if I actually have both effects going on, neither monitor nor inhibitor are getting to diffuse around fast enough. So they're both getting depleted at the center of exposures. I first start out with inhibitor that uh, dynamics dominating, getting narrow features. Then I come back to some place where I get the sort of canceling out, and I get back to my sinusoid, and in a long time, I get one of the dynamics uh, dominating. So that gives me knobs to reach in and try to control the three dimensional distribution of chemicals. That's everything I was going to tell you about theoretical modeling, but I thought gave you flavor for what was happening. You said in terms of controlling, obviously, as a dimension, as the viscosity goes up, the diffusion is down. The color is going to increase that temperature. Yep, um, or the photopolarization reaction is exothermic. And so if you focus down, I'll, you can actually calculate, you can get 50, 60 degree temperature rises just from the exotherm itself. So that's kind of cool because now you have some local region where uh, diffusion is much more allowed than others. Um, yeah, that's why they're fun. So lots of, lots of fun things you can do. We, you start out using them what I call a small signal regime, where you try to make the index change small enough, the, uh, the uh, intensity patterns uh, are, are, are not going to be strongly influenced by absorption uh, or index, et cetera. So you can linearize everything. Um, and you try to get that under control, and then you work your way out in the same place. Um, and the, the, holographic, the, 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 the holographic data story application is the perfect example of that, because they've got hundreds of little weak exposures. Um, and so they can live in a world that they don't have to get too concerned about logs. But it's fun to go off, as you say, and collect heat to temperature and, um, and play with the material. So, here's sort of things that you can do with materials, and this is just way fun. Um, this uh, is, I got a fancy name, but basically I'm going to take a laser beam, I'm going to condition and control it with my computer a little bit, and I'm going to focus it into a slab of this material. And I might just have the material in between a couple of glass slides, easy, cheap way to cast it. Um, and I might have embedded some things in I'll show you that. Like fiber. Because remember, I can cast this material around anything. Fibers, mirrors, cracker suits, you know, still um, It turns out it's nice to know what's going on, to be able to find things. 
So if we're operating here, let's say blue violet, we might, uh, and the material sensitive there, we might in green have a set of microscopes. Someone wants to control the reflection, and this is against my transmission microscope. The whole point is that gives us, looking through the system objective, some ways to see things down in the sample. I'll show you what that's for. And then I got the sample and motion system to move around. So here's a real simple example. Actually, so this is the, uh, this is the, the sample right here. Again, this is these differential uh, interface interference contrast microscope pictures. If I just simply defocus the beam, I expose it for a minute, then close the shutter, move it over, do it again, I make it one slow right. Um, which is actually a really nifty way to make one slow right. And these are actually pretty credible inputs. Um, I can go down pretty small scale or up to pretty big scales. Um, reasonably high numerical apertures. Um, and I can sort of print it on demand, and that's fun, and they develop all by themselves. I've got one Or I can take a big thick sample, like that one, and I can simply take my green, in this case, green sensitive material, and drag the focus all the way through it. These are uh, actual experimental data, and they look really clean, but it's a very high signal from the graphic method that uh, the graphic students worked out. And so I take a cross section of these little waveguides going through this material, and I've got about a six micron diameter, and they go about six millimeters through, which is really in the, the aspect ratio. And these make really nice waveguides because they're gradient index. So there's no edges to scatter off of, which is a big source of loss and things like that. So the waveguides. I'm using about a microwatt of laser power here. These materials are really sensitive. And if you've heard of femtosecond writing in glass, it's very, very similar, except orders of magnitude more sensitive because of the organic chemistry and because one photon can, can cause, cause 10,000 polymerization events. So a very large amplification. Um, you can match these to fibers, and that's a handy thing. And of course, I do straight ones here because it's a great way to test, but I can draw my name in here if I wanted to in 3D, uh, here's the wave guide out. Controlling its peak index, its shape, its size, so I can do tapers and all sorts of crazy fun things. Um, so here's the paper data. This is just that I can do it. Uh, here I've got a nice strong wave guide here. And I've simply tapered the peak delta n. It looks like this thing's getting smaller, but it's actually just the peak delta n is decreasing. And that causes about a 1 2 mode taper. Or I can keep a nice constant, you know, a nice constant mode. And that's nice for matching this electron wave guide with all those problems and fun stuff. I mentioned oxygen and inhibition, so here's an example of using that. Again, this is tomographic data reading these waveguides out. And basically, I'm assuming what I'd like to do is I'd like to take this threshold level, and I've got some intensity, and I'd like to just sort of raise the threshold level up and see if I can squeeze the size of my waveguides down. Now, it's actually easier, instead of raising the threshold up, just to bring my intensity levels down and sort of pull myself down towards the threshold level and want to make it smaller. To do that, I can normalize the peak index change. But if I do that, I find that if I write with lots and lots of energy, I get uh, maybe 10-ish, 20-ish, maybe close to 20-ish full width path max waveguides. And as I take the energy down, I get the, the edges nicely cut off, and I'm getting much, much smaller structures. And if you sort of fit to a, a power law, which is not perfect, it's a single, single number you can describe, at high energies, I see this half photon dependence energy, and that's what I expected of this radical material. But as I get closer and closer to the threshold, I drive myself up actually past what you'd expect in a perfectly linear material. And if I kept going, I'd get up from something closer to two photon response. Even though it's really fundamentally responding like a half a photon, if I can say that in the physics world here. So you really can use this uh, uh, a lot to your advantage to control the shapes and sizes that we use. That's exciting. Okay, so what do I do? I can make wave beds now. Who cares? I can make wave beds lots of ways. So now, now I'll tell you sort of why sort of the combination of these material properties might be cool. Let me take a slab of glass and let them loosely position some fibers and a cube, uh, a beam splitter, flutter record crystal, some optical component component. I'm going to cast the material over it. It goes from a liquid to a solid state, almost no shrinkage stress. That's due to the chemists being good at what they do. I'm going to use those microscopes. I'm going to find those fiber tips with some micron accuracy and find those spaces and their tilts. And tell my computer to connect them up with three dimensional rather wave guides. Maybe with some papers in it, I'm going to figure it out. And I end up with some circuit that's got anything you've got here on your optical table. Now we're going to do the chip. And that's kind of one of the neat things about it. The combination of three dimensional wave guides and the ability to cast around other things is, uh, is a nice thing. That's, that's a hard thing to do with say, color vectors. So the dream is to be able to make very complex integrated systems with lots and lots of type of components. And except for the laser dial here, now we've done most of these things. So we're sort of building a control here. As an example, 
here is fiber fiber interconnect. Uh, this is extremely expensive for the type of slide holder. Cost I think five cents. So we cast the polymer in between two plastic windows here. We shove some fibers in the side with the fibers in that <coughs> casting. Then with our microscope, we found that tip and that tip and that tip, and then you can't see it there. And then once we found those XYZ coordinates, it is Z, so we have about some of the micromounts of depth here. We arranged the fibers to be out of plane in depth as well. We drew from here to here. There's a, uh, again, a DIC picture of this. Actually, this isn't a DIC picture, it's a, a different microscope. Here's the fiber, here's the core, you can see that inside the fiber, and there's the way that we inscribed on the end Notice this is not done through putting light out of the fiber core. But there's probably 50 papers in the literature about just taking a shutting some light out of the fiber core having it sort of go up here. The problem is you can't steer and you can't go very far. It's really fun to manage, but it's really generally useless. Um, remember, I said I could do this with microwatts. So since I'm an engineer, if I've got a watt laser there and I'm using a microwatt, I'm unhappy. So we should do it a million times. So I'm playing something. Um, so this is why I was casting these tables. Here's just the pure matrix. Here's the matrix with the initiator in it. So you can see the color. I know what we've done in a beautiful lens design, but one of my students can take a plane of light here, let's say an array of dots, and project it into this glass chamber. And I'm going to take this photosensitive table and thread it through there, constant velocity. And it's moving right through this focal plane here, where all these different focus, it exposes the whole array of waveguides all at once. And that allows you to make things like endoscopes, which are imaging solids, right? Where each of these waveguides carries a little bit of the image. And I can only do that because these materials are so beautifully sensible. Or, I heard about these a little bit earlier, I can make them a conic control way by my heavy map view pattern. So here's some of the right spots. These actually work in some actually, but we'll be making them on that hard work pretty soon. So here's, again, these are DIC pictures, so it looks like the shadows on the surface, but these are actually just pictures of the index, and that should carry a nice mode. And the reason that's cool, of course, is I can control the whole area and dispersion uh, with waves much, much uh, stronger than it can. We're trying to shift these down to uh, carry the other thing the light, uh, for reasons you can all probably figure out. Um, I can make holograms, I'm just kind of showing you the fun points. Uh, I can make hologram light uh, uh, interference pattern. Since the materials are so beautifully flexible, I can squeeze it. And when I squeeze it by the sun, sorry, show, it, uh, it changes its pitch this way. So it's set up with a reflection hologram in the infrared. The peak reflectivity moves. This is kind of crazy data because of the things that are making this better. But the point is, I've got about 120 nanometers of tuning here, which means it's a pretty broad band to the filter. Um, and that was the semester experiment for the grad just to get started with the CPU pad. So it's pretty easy to do. Yeah, I'll kind of speed up here, but this is just to sort of give you the, the, the oh my god, I just had too much fun with these materials. So this is work I did in industry actually when we first started playing with materials. It's again a data storage application, very, very different than things. I've got a green sensitive material here, so I've got to use diagonal salt. I don't want to modulate it, so I've got to use an AMM. You can do this today in flu with a, a direct current injection. And I'm going to run the laser down, focus it into the material, and most of the light comes out the back. And I'm going to put a cat's eye right reflector here. I'm going to uh, passively realign this beam, and it come right back up. And so they're going to interfere, making a micron scale interference pattern. Then I'm going to spin this sucker up around 3600 RPM, so the edge of it's moving by 20 meters per second. And I'm going to turn this on and off uh, every five nanoseconds. And I'm going to write holograms into this material that are a micron size. And it's actually kind of neat to operate at that speed because vibrations don't happen in five nanoseconds. So I can kick the crud out of this thing, and it can't possibly move during the exposure time. And so it's a big surprise for holography into moving materials. I think I got the speed record. Um, and then I'll move down to another layer, another layer, another layer, and I'll separate those out. Filter. So it's kind of a nifty little big storage method, and I can only do it because I can expose the five nanoseconds you know, because the materials are so uh, darn sensitive. And so you can do that, and again, we about 20 meters per second. The 125 micron thick material, we stack up 12 layers in it, some of the data. And so you, you write these little reflectors, and then they're little focal reflectors. You can then read them up, and there's all the data. So it's kind of fun. But wait, so by now. And this is maybe relevant for the liver crystal community, and of course, the obvious overlap here is liver crystal stabilized on the polymers. Um, the polymers stabilized in the um, And the ability to really control chemical densities. So, what if we, if you're working in the industry and your mechanical engineers tell you they're going to quit if you don't make that head go away? They just really, 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 really hate having a second head in the drive. 
So your job, and it was my job, was obviously to figure out how to make the same thing, but never need any uniform contact for this. So what we did is we exposed this disk with a big hole. I'll show you that here. And so this is a reflection hologram. This has got some funny patterns in it. I did that by superimposing multiple holograms to give it the right pattern. But basically, this is just a reflection hologram. So if I shine this light on the hologram, it would reflect the light go back. And then if I could somehow blow a hole in it, it wouldn't reflect anymore. And that, but I, I would call that waking data. So I'm going to have now a disk which is sort of filled with ones, if you like. It's reflective everywhere. And then when I blow a hole in it, it goes zero. It turns out it's easier to destroy things than just to make them. So that was a good strategy. So we have lots of other final things to make that pattern in the first place. The main point is we take a laser, we run it through an AO device to create three beams that are uh, temporally incoherent. We split those up and we send them all in a disk. That's in a model of the cell. And so we have six beams converging on this disk. And every time we bring it in phase, we can make multiple holograms that are superimposed and create lots of patterns like that. This is experimental data from the microscope. We're standing around in this. Wherever we see a bright spot, it must mean we have a little reflection hologram. Catch and of course, yeah. Uh, but, uh, and I arranged this so I see radial tracks and depth players, and this is ran all the way around the disk. So now instead of I got this makes my servo engineers happy because they have something to track on and everything like that. So I have little tubes of reflection that are micron size, so the microns tall when they make runs wide, to wrap around my disk in this photo ball. What am I gonna do with it? Well the first thing I do is I blow it because it's fun. Um, so I can read out, and I get a little noise in my system, and I worry about that, but as I read out, I get some reflectivity. And then I point to Tyson Fire, and I go bang, 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 bang. And then I come back and I read out, and sure enough, I darken people in eyes and yank bits off of uh, Palmer. And so when I read that, those regions, I see the increases in reflectivity. And that's exciting, but not very commercially uh, applicable. So then I go on, and this is, this is maybe the best of the So now I built a polymer in this reflection hologram. That's the black one. Now I'm going to design my initiator so it won't diffuse. I make it big enough that it can't move around. And I'm dialing an amount of initiator down so that when I expose my original hologram, I consume all the initiator in the bright fringes. So it's gone. But it still exists where I was previously dark. So now I've nanostructured both the polymer and the initiator on a 170 nanometer scale and out of phase. Monitor has had to be used around, so it's sitting here uniform. So I have a reflection hologram, which I can see through that polymer, and I have a structured sensitivity for this pitch, and it's perfectly out of phase with my previous grade. So now if I shine a light on the material, it will polymerize, but only where there isn't any polymer, filling in the fringes and erasing my grade. Like that. Um, so I can write that. Data and wherever I hit the sucker with light, oh, it reflected the disappears. Because I can structure both of these things. Um, by controlling the view. And so this is what it looks like when you scan along the track. Here's linear polarization, linear initiator, or really right. Indeed, reflected the I make a two photon initiator, I have a power spare, and they get smaller, which they should have. Because I fill in those fringes. And now I can do that multiple interference and stack up my layers of tracks. So this is a cross section through those tracks. Here's a track that I have written on. And wherever I turn my light on, the reflectivity went away. So this is the pattern now of both the polymer and the initiator that we've done the disk. Getting kind of complex. But the fact is you can get down there and you can't be cold. It isn't that hard if you pay attention to what you're doing. Um, and I can back and modify it with cold speed. And then finally, I'm just about done. Actually, I'm done with the And this is kind of fun for material testing folks. We found this in my accident. We wrote a grade, and we left the laser focused on it for a while, but it was, it was a photo intensive grade. We bleached all the issues out. And all of a sudden, we saw the reflectivity disappear. And we turned the laser off, and it came back. And, well, that's weird. What's going on? We were thermally distorting the grade, mm -hmm. and Bragg mismatching it. And so that was fun. If you distort it inelastically, you go far enough that it won't come back, you once again have for permanent data. You can set the gradient up so initially it is not correct resonance, and you can tune it into resonance. Um, and the reason that might be interesting for material testing is this is basically nano indentation, but down the bottom. Because what you're doing with the heat bang 
because you're causing a little deformation of the material. And with the Bragg gradient, then, you're tracing out the Bragg selectivity curve of that material as it starts. And you can measure, if you set your microscope up cleverly, 20, 30 nanometer displacements down the material in response to, and as this, this is repeated hitting the single material, we're seeing the mechanical properties change as we trace out each of these. So we can go down to micron scales with tens of nanometer sensitivity and measure things like stress and strain. That's kind of interesting. Okay, I will finish up just to tell you, okay, where is the field going? Uh, this is uh, one slide. Christiane's actually get 98% of the, the uh, uh, credit for this, but she did work in a uh, great issue. She the holes in my lab, so I'll show the slide. This is absolutely the opposite process. This is a hydrogel for issue scaffold applications. 95% water, 5% polymer, but it, 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 it's a little more fragile than the material, but it's essentially the same thing. It's this rubbery solid, and if you leave it out on your desk, it will dry out and make it fine. And it's photolabic. That is, it's gelled uh, when I, it goes into the lab, the optics lab, but there are bonds in there that can be broken by the light. So instead of polymerizing and joining things up, I will depolymerize. And if I do enough of that, I will completely depolymerize the grain or the, or the material, and I will make holes because now with the water being in there, those little fragments will drift out, and I have a chance. So exactly the same thing I showed before, but upside down. Now instead of writing these higher density features, I can write lower density features, which means I can write those chemicals, or I can make channels that for neurons to express down or something like that. Much the same process, only upside down. And then this is work with uh, Tim Scott and Chris Bowman in chemical engineering. Uh, I just wait on. Um, so I've got an initiator, this is its spectrum here, and it's been absorbed strongly on the blue. And it's really important, uh, but like it's important from my perspective, the photo initiator initiates a monomer that it's called. But there's a second chemical here, and this is its spectrum right here, and it is a photo-created inhibitor. Basically, it makes radicals which are really good at eating other radicals. So whenever I excite this material with the ultraviolet, uh, I shut polymerization down. So I have a go now, and I stop now. And that turns out to be really fun. Because what happens is the projector decides to turn off. So, <laughs> I'm the one. I talked too long, I guess. <laughs> well, uh, I'll finish up the paper. <laughs> I have to go back to old technology. What we do. So when I put UV light on this material, it, uh, it shuts down the polarization I would normally induce in the blue. And I make it come up with a Anyone familiar with uh, Stefan Hill's STED microscope? Much similar in, in inspiration. So we're going to put uh, a blue spot of light on this material and plot of it here. And that would normally make polymerization in some little spot about the same size. But now I'm going to surround that at its edges with a donut mode, the gaussian air mode, in this inhibiting light. And then in fact, it's going to look about like this. And the gaussian air mode would look about like that. And here, polarization can no longer occur because I hit the off mode and shut it down. So what happens is I put all the polymer right there. And the whole point of this is to get way beyond the crash limit so that I can reach down because engineers like little things, right? Um, so I can have my diffraction limited spot size here and here. Both these, both the blue and the UV here, coming through an objective that are limited by the diffraction limit to a certain size. But the actual polarization can be, so far it's going to be factor seven smaller than the light. And I you don't know, think that's the yeah, for factor ten. So I can get to nanoscale fabrication in three dimensions through visible light excitation at human eyes. Um, so that's kind of fun. Um, and uh, we're looking at that as next generation photography. If you're familiar with two photon 3D lithography, we just stand around and make little wine cups and molds and other cool looking <coughs> things. This is a way to go way beyond that in this case, because the two photon limit would be about there in terms of size. And we're way, way below that. Because the two photon is like this intensity squared in terms of size of the feature. For this guy, it's like 
the blue minus the and that minus turns out to be a much better way to make tiny things than that square. Um, so this is just was just going to finish with this to say the fun of working with organic materials. If you've worked with photographers, they're fascinated and they're critically to educate students in every possible physics known to man. But they're limited in the amount of control they have. The organics are wonderful things you can go in and change them and have initiators and change the color and lots of fun stuff. The downside is they're very complex and they're not changing anything. So you can spend a career time understanding what's going on. Okay, so thank you very much. Question and then you can talk to, to Bob after. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm guessing that the chemical composition is proprietary. Um, I'm not sure. This particular in phase one is, though I refer you to go to a patent search and search for the name in phase if you'd like to know what's in it. Okay. Um, however, they have published certain materials which are very, very similar in the open domain, and I can give you those papers. We're making them in my lab. And it turns out that these materials are highly engineered to be really, really great. But any owner operated uh, above its TG will have all these effects happen. And I, I've yet to point light at a photopolymer and not get something like this to happen. So it, it's really easy to get started. If, if one were to evaluate the potential for making technology for data storage, uh -huh. sort of three dimensional array, could one at this point predict uh, cost effectiveness? and you compare the current read-write technology and the read-head magnetically to this holographic thing, and would I be able to go to Office Depot and buy it? That's, that's an extraordinarily large question. I, I'm actually a program chair at the Data Storage Conference. Um, I'll give you a short answer, so he isn't beating up. Um, the sort of things that I showed up here, which look a lot like traditional storage, would be very cost similar, right? Because it's a laser diode focused on a little head, and so that would be very similar. Now, whether that technology's got other problems or whatever is a different question. But cost wise, it would be much the same. The in phase, or, or the, the, the folks that are doing the, the page based holographic, really cool, high performance stuff, um, the amount of technology in their drive is astounding. Um, there's high performance liquid crystal displays uh, from uh, this uh, uh, group here. Uh, there's custom cameras, there's uh, external cavities, uh, laser diodes, uh, it's just unbelievable the amount of stuff in that box. So they're not intending to sell that to you for Office Depot, they're going to Turner Broadcasting and say, would you like to store all of your movies for the last 400 years? That's kind of the market trend. So it's going to be a $30,000 drive for doing that's actually the journey. So very short. What's the matter is the robot with the polymerized material. Is it a mixture of polymer and monomer and the wood, or is it dry? The reason why, why I ask is the mass density of monomer and polymer are usually very similar. Uh -huh. right. So, how do you think that that's a great Let me try to answer it. If I'm not getting it, then we'll let him shut us down and talk a little bit about the copyright. Um, I've got diffused in here, the initiator, the monomer, and if I make it, I start making polymer in here. Um, it's, it's dry in the sense that, you know, I, I'm not feeling any liquid here. There are, there are liquid-like components diffused through this matrix. Um, the way, and, and you're right, the mass density of monomer and polymer are very, very similar. And that's the reason that if I do an exposure and I look immediately afterwards, I wouldn't really see much index change the index is similarly about the same. So the thing that makes large index change is the fact that the monomer is mobile and it moves around. So I deplete the monomer concentration with making polymer that's the exact opposite. Then new monomer runs in to fill out that hole. So totally the density goes up here because I have more monomer plus polymer than the location. That's the key of it. Okay, so thanks again, Bob, and thanks also all just for the for the